Okay, I think we um, we might make a start. So, um, good good morning, all, and um, first of all, thank you so much for um, getting up so early to come to this wonderful breakfast session. Um, it, it is a bit more of a um, an informal session in the sense that um, we will encourage you to grab some breakfast, um, particularly coffee um, if you need it. Um, I'm already on my fourth cup, so um, um, I'll, I'll try not to. Um, Babble on too much, but um, thank you very much for um, for coming. And, and like I said, um, uh, formal in the sense, uh, informal in the sense that feel free to grab some um, breakfast, um, and then we'll, um, we'll we'll kick on with our formal proceedings as well. Um, my name's um, Dragon Illich. Um, I'm from uh, Monash University and the School of Public Health, and it's uh, a great pleasure to bring uh, to you all uh, this breakfast session. Um, as we said. Um, the intention is that it is interactive. Uh, we've got four wonderful speakers uh, who I'll introduce shortly. Um, and we've also got, um, hopefully, a, um, a very good um, interactive uh, session as well with our panel discussion and um, uh, participation from, from audiences um, as well. Um, before I do um, go any further, I, I do wish to uh, um, acknowledge the traditional owners of Nam, the people of the Kulin Nations on whose country we gather on for this event. Um, we pay our respects to their elders past and present and also to the elders of uh, all First Nations communities that are joining us here today. Uh, we would also like to extend our acknowledgement to all First Nation peoples and recognise their unique, crucial and enduring contributions to societies all over the world. Um, as mentioned, um, we've got a what I like to think is a, a stellar lineup for you um, uh, today uh, to, di to discuss um, an issue close to my heart. So um, my, my day job, um, when I'm not uh, facilitating breakfast sessions, um, I'm the um, deputy head of the um, School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine, uh, specifically overseeing the education portfolio. So this session, we've got four wonderful speakers um, looking to pick apart um, this topic of um, breaking barriers, building bridges, and shaping the future of public and global health education. Um, we've got um, what I like to think is the, the showcase of Monash University, not only locally but also internationally. Um, we have um, our interim Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Education, Professor Ali Clements. Uh, we've got our wonderful Deputy Dean of Education from our Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences, Professor Claire Palermo. Um, we've got our wonderful and, and inaugural um, course coordinator for the Master of Public Health over at our Monash University Indonesia campus, Associate Professor Henry Surendra, and the fantastic Professor Basha Duig, who is uh, Head of Undergraduate Courses, as well as uh, my colleague and um, Head of Quality and Innovation for our wonderful unit called the Medical Education Research and Quality Unit. Um, so I'm not going to speak too much uh, more. Um, just to set the scene, I guess, as, as the topic suggests, we're, we're looking at really breaking and shaking things up uh, when it comes to um, public and, and um, global health education. Um, we're, we're looking at trying to identify the barriers, the challenges, the opportunities, uh, the areas in which we can innovate moving forward. Um, We've got four wonderful speakers who will talk about different aspects of public health and, um, and global health education, um, specifically, I guess, honing in on aspects such as um, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, authentic assessment, cultural competencies, um, and challenges and opportunities moving forward. So without further ado, um, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, uh, Professor Ali Clements, our De Interim Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Education. Uh, Ali. Good morning, everyone. Wonderful to be at this breakfast session. Thank you for your commitment to come so early. I'm so looking forward to my cup of coffee after this. Um, today, I just want to begin by echoing um, Dragon's acknowledgement that we are on the, people, on the land of the people of the Kulin Nations, and I acknowledge country and pay my respects to elders past and present. Today, my, in my contribution, I want to discuss the impact of artificial intelligence that I will refer to as AI, to speed things up as I go, on education broadly, and to, to talk a little bit about its potential to enhance learning and preparing graduates for the workplace. I want to use Monash University as a case 
for the way a global institution such as ours, very strong in health programs, strong in, it, in, in research, and strong in graduate employability too, has responded to AI. But to start, I'm going to start with some humour. Not quite in the way that you might expect, though. But here goes. There is such a thing as the International Society for Humor Studies, I discovered just a few days ago. And it held its annual conference in the US. And one of the papers that was presented at this conference was how funny is chat GPT? A PhD researcher at an American university collected data on this by generating jokes through, chat, through both channels, human generated jokes and chat GPT generated jokes and asked people, which of the jokes do you find more funny? Needless to say, the chat GPT was voted as the funnier generator of jokes than those of humans. So if then we think for a moment that we are all in the business of generating or developing humorous capability in these times, we might ask ourselves some of these questions. Should we ban students from using ChatGPT in learning about humour and in performing their assessments? Should educators use ChatGPT to generate teaching material about developing humour? Should we start to ask students to generate humour via ChatGPT and to explain the features of humour that they see, the kinds of stereotypes that some humour might be perpetuating, how relevant particular jokes may be for, for certain scenarios. Should we ask ChatGPT to mark the humorous assessment outputs, to rate and rank them according to criteria? We could go on with this analogy. But the point here is to present some of the quandaries around building workforce capability with AI. So then using Monash University as a case, I want to share with you three of my learnings over the last year or so. The first, I have no slides, so I'm going to take you with me, take you with me using my words. The first lesson I want to share with you is that adopting AI is a choice. It's a choice about institutional and educational relevance. It's not a choice about AI. When generative AI first appeared at the end of 2022 now, it was seen to pose an immediate and existential threat to education. A crisis seemed to be before us. Our staff at Monash waited to see what choice we would make as an institution. Would we ban AI or would we embrace it? But it was not about banning and it was not about embracing. The choice was about institutional and educational relevance. It was about whether we looked forward as an institution towards AI. Forward meant opening up. An institution that recognized, recognized this would understand and did understand that a significant change in the skill sets would be, that would be required by students and future professionals. A change would be required in the skill sets of our staff and a change would be required in our approach to education for future professionals. Forward also meant being explicit about how we went forward, being ethical, thinking about responsible use. Backwards or banning meant we would lock the doors, shut the windows, and prepare for irrelevancy. And so, of course, there was only one choice, um, only one way to proceed, and the journey began. Now, the second lesson that I share with you from our university is that adopting AI is a journey. It's not a destination. We know that rapidly evolving AI developments have much potential to advance health practices with more safety, accuracy, efficiency, information processing, evidence to inform decision making, greater personalization. Universities must prepare workforces of the future to engage with this. But where did our journey start at Monash? Well, as our educator community came to terms with AI, most banned it from their assessments. Slightly more accepted it as part of teaching, but not so much in assessments. And when we surveyed our, our staff cohort around 12 months into the journey, this is what we discovered. 
Around 55% of our staff cohort were using it, 45% not. The greatest lack of perceived, um, sorry, the greatest lack of, of confidence perceived by staff were, was in the Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences and the Faculty of Law. Yet interestingly, the greatest amount of recent relevant in industry experience of all of our staff were among those in the Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences, which wasn't surprising. The greatest industry experience, the greatest sense of lack of confidence. What did our student cohort tell us around six months into the journey? Well, students in our STEM faculties, IT, engineering, and our business faculty were the highest users of Gen AI. Students in our Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences and Pharmacy were the lowest users of it. We also expected to find that the, the greatest prevalence of use, declared use, amongst our students was to be in how they undertook their assessments, but that wasn't to be. What they declared was the greatest use for them was in the area of study, creating study notes, brainstorming, preparing to engage with the content that they were being taught. Just as an aside, not so relevant to the topic, at the time, males were the highest users um, of Gen AI and our international students higher users than our domestic cohort. So our journey has been to naturalise it into our practices at our university. Just like with other tech advances, the internet, smartphones, social media, it takes time. There is a transition phase before new things feel like they become business as usual. And so AI is a journey. It's a journey for both the health education workforce as much as it is a journey for healthcare professionals, future and current. And there is no point of arrival this journey will keep evolving. My third lesson to share, my third and last lesson, you might be pleased to know, to share. Using or adopting AI augments educational opportunity. So when we think about educational practice, what will not change, even with all of the AI developments that come before us? What will not change? is that the cornerstone of a 21st century higher education, developing critical thinking, the ability to synth synthesize, the ability to communicate clearly, the ability to practice ethically, will remain. That is not going to change. But there are some things that can change and already have started to. There are opportunities to use AI for students to more easily bridge theory and practice to practice skills, to develop capabilities, including debating, critiquing, problem solving, idea generation. There's already some examples at our university of Monash educators embedding AI into the curriculum. Project ATLAS, which stands for Authentic Teaching and Learning Application Simulations, a mouthful, ATLAS is a good acronym, is a really interesting AI ecosystem that offers healthcare students opportunities through immersive and simulated experiences to practice communicating with patients using large language models and, and, and AI. There may also be an opportunity to make things more efficient in our education space. For example, developing and using chatbots to gain and to provide instant feedback to students. AI the opportunity of AI also means that we will be able to become and we must become more discerning about the human elements of performance that we want to cultivate and of course maintain. With AI assistance at hand, we need to get clear or even clearer. What are the skill sets that can rely or should only rely on human performance alone? And then where can AI be a powerful and a quick collaborator to assist us with thinking and doing? And the last opportunity I want to highlight is it could mean, AI could mean more relational practice. Rather than thinking about AI technologies inserting itself between practitioner and patient and weakening the bond or the relationship, 
In fact, there could be greater opportunity to strengthen human-to-human -human relationships by integrating AI into the equation. The same is true for educa educators and students. The most powerful opportunities will come not from AI doing the assessments, not from AI providing feedback, but by embedding AI into education practices to allow us to understand students more, to allow us to respond to students in a more personalised fashion, to get closer with AI rather than further apart. So, in closing, for me, AI creates new pitfalls but also new possibilities. For some, it has promoted a lot of distrust with calls for detection always audible. For others, it's created renewed energy to new forms of capability building. The principles of good education will remain, particularly in how we develop workforce capability. But by looking forward, and we can only look forward, AI needs to be folded into education rather than separated from it. We need to ensure the values that drive its adoption are always progressive. So AI for me presents much opportunity to reimagine, to redefine education in the way that it prepares our current workforce and our future workforce through powerful ways to learn about practice. Thank you, everyone. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Ali, for uh, setting the scene and um, uh, taking us um, on the first set of our journey. Um, I'll uh, welcome now our Deputy Dean Education from the Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences, Professor Claire Palermo, to take us on the next step of the journey. Um, and looking at authentic assessment. Claire. Thanks, Dragon. <clears throat> and a topic very dear to my heart, and good morning to you all. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and recognise I'm an inhabitor of this land and that I work towards a future of shared uh, and respectful trust between our Indigenous people of this country and the world. So when we think about assessment and we're thinking about preparing the workforce for the future, we can't... Um, deny this important landmark work uh, around what it is to be uh, a healthcare or a health professional. And this beautiful um, illustration of what outcome-based education, or others call it competency-based education, really needs to look like. Um, and ideally, it says that what the health workforce needs to be should be driven what, about what the health needs of the community are, what the health system needs are, and what the workforce needs are. So what are the current gaps in our capabilities? Um, and this then defines what the workforce outcomes are. And that then guides what, we, what, what inputs we put in, in terms of curriculum, and then also what then, um, or how we measure that those outcomes are achieved and ideally that assessment should very clearly mimic what those workforce outcomes are defined to be or um, in some professions they call them practice standards or competency standards. But what happens unfortunately in health workforce preparation is that the workforce outcomes sort of lag behind where our health system, health service, health community, health needs actually are and so I think we're always about five to ten years behind where we actually really need to be in health workforce preparation. So our challenge is to constantly update these you know, graduate outcomes um, to make sure that we're preparing a workforce that's actually ready for the work that we need to do. And I think our recent pandemic was a, a fantastic example of that, that we weren't ready um, for, that, for that capability. So how do we kind of move forward in terms of our education within this context? Um, accreditation helps guide some of it um, to actually push us towards this, but again, uh, accreditation often lags behind where it really needs to be and certainly in some of the healthcare professions that I work with in our faculty, uh, their accreditation standards are very um, input driven and perhaps not necessarily reflective of the workforce uh, that we need. However, there's been lots of shifts, for example, recent push around interprofessional education, 
um, and ensuring our graduates are culturally safe and responsive. And that's saying very clearly out loud our graduates aren't good enough in those areas and we need to actually push our curriculum to, to <laughs> cover those things so that they're better prepared. Um, and why um, we need to think about changing assessment in the context of this um, health workforce preparation is that we know that our current assessment practices in health are pretty archaic. We, as you've just heard from Ali, we've not embraced AI at all. We tend to rely on history and the way we were educated as healthcare professions. Um, we also know um, that the approaches that we use don't often um, build student agency and we really need to, if we're trying to create lifelong learners that continue, can continue to adapt and modify their practice, engage in lifelong learning so that they continue to meet the health, health workforce needs, we need to promote student agency. Um, so what this means is we need to develop assessment that builds learner li literacy um, and them driving and being a key stakeholder in the assessment process. Um, the, other, um, the other way we need to think about changing assessment is that um, we need to think about much more authentic assessments and other, other attributes around assessments to really guide um, better, better practice, I suppose, in the way learners engage in, in learning. Um, so we really need to move away from assessments that um, kind of control people's own motivation. So assessments that focus on factual knowledge um, and that kind of memory recall. Uh, and what that results in, this literature review found, was essentially this very surface level uh, of learning. What we need to promote is this really autonomous motivation. So one where context um, is really uh, important in the learning, where it's fun, that there's usually a team-based approach to learning and supports connection through the material quite deeply and they have much more positive outcomes. Um, and so we need to really think about what we're doing in some of our design around assessment. For example, grades. Um, how well does that actually promote autonomous motivation? It, it, it tends to promote the individual um, wanting to do better than everyone else. So there's lots of different uh, philosophies I think we need to think about as we um, go forward with assessment. And I just wanted to finish off um, uh, by sharing where our faculty's at in terms of embracing the world of AI, for example, but also some of this broader outcome-focused uh, education. And that's in moving towards uh, ensuring that our assessment regimes align with these five principles. And the one that Dragon asked me to talk about was more around authenticity. And what does that mean? And that means essentially doing what a graduate is expected to do in the workplace. You know, do they need to really learn how to write an essay? How many of you in your practice actually write an essay? Maybe an abstract for a conference, you might, but actually really thinking about what are the, what are the skills that we're trying to build um, and then how do our assessment tasks mimic that of those graduate outcomes and making sure that they're really clearly aligned and that they are actually measuring um, the outcome that's articulated. Um, in no particular order, but uh, programmatic approaches is really key to good assessment practice. And um, it's in fact one of the key principles of us working towards integration of artificial intelligence in our assessment going forward. And what that means is about thinking holistically at assessment in terms of multiple methods and triangulating those methods taking away this idea of formative and summative and going to much more high stakes, low stakes language. It means um, thinking about continuous assessment. It, it means thinking about multiple people having stakes in assessment, including the learner, and it is about having learner agency. Um, and it is quite a different way of thinking about assessment. Um, it certainly challenges even our you know, semester structure if, we, if you think about the way we design and structure our learning in universities, but it's where we need to head if we're really to head in the direction of better practice in assessment. Constructive alignment goes without saying, but I think that comes back to thinking about those graduate outcomes. Are we measuring what we actually really um, need to see in our graduates upon entry to the, to the workforce? 
We need to also build our assessor expertise and make sure they're equipped to actually do the assessment that they are there to do, but make sure we've got good moderation and um, we're having conversations about assessment. We need to move away, um, Dragon will let me saying this, move away from trying to get everyone to tick the same box, that everyone agrees that there's a, you know, a scale that's actually reliable and valid in, ter in terms of measuring assessment, to actually embracing the, the different ways people are seeing that performance and uh, a much more constructivist approach to actually the performance or the outcome that we're seeing. Um, and we need to not think that one single tool is going to give us all the data we need about uh, assessment or performance. So we need really good tools, um, but we need multiple different tools to measure the nuance of what we need in the workforce. Um, to be a health practitioner, to work in public health, you need an extraordinary link of, uh, a number of s special skills, and there's no way one instrument can measure those things. You need something to measure professionalism. You need something to measure your ability to, you know, conduct a health care assessment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we need multiple tasks to actually do that, to actually help us triangulate and get that picture of assessment. So that's where we're headed in the faculty, um, and uh, I think movements across the world certainly in health professions education is moving towards programmatic assessment, but we've got a long way to go and I challenge you to think about um, these practices in your day-to-day -day work. Thanks, Dragon. Thank you so much, Claire. And um, Claire, Claire's a great example of um, showing me new tricks. Um, so you can teach a, a relatively uh, older dog new tricks, uh, that being me, so moving away from the um, stats as, as uh, Claire said. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Henry um, up to the stage now. So um, we're, we're in a really fortunate position with Monash University um, and, our, and, and our international campuses. We've got um, obviously Monash um, Australia, but we've also got campuses in Indonesia, Malaysia, um, China, uh, as well as um, outposts um, across the subcontinent and Europe. Um, so, so one of the things that uh, I, I guess where uh, could be easy to do is just take one of our courses and replicate it overseas. Um, Henry's here to show us that it's um, not that easy, um, and there are very um, uh, many um, issues that we need to um, keep in mind. So, with that, I'll hand over to you, Henry. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Dragon. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming so early. Even I, I'm a, I was a bit worried last night because I thought, okay, 7.30, it's going to be like 4.30 in Indonesia. And, uh, and I was afraid that I, I won't you know, wake up early in the morning. But uh, here I am, and uh, thank you for, for all the attendance. So first of all, I wish to also uh, acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nations on whose land we are gathered today, and I pay my respects uh, to their elder, past, and uh, present. Okay, so like, uh, as, so I took these three pictures from um, a WHO website discussing about um, uh, health inequity, actually. So as you remember from a lot of speakers yesterday, they have been talking about the importance of um, addressing health uh, inequity uh, to achieve a better uh, population health uh, status. As you know that among other, other factors, there are some factors like uh, race, uh, gender, socioeconomics, health literacy, beliefs, values, and, and other factors that can affect um, health uh, popula uh, outcomes in uh, our population. And as Dragon mentioned before, that um, setting up a new uh, Master of Public Health programs uh, in Indonesia, so this is the second year, so we, we, we just have our second cohort um, earlier this, uh, this year. It's not as easy as like taking uh, all the units and structure from uh, the faculty here in Melbourne and then just implement all of them uh, uh, in Indonesia. Of course, uh, the, the program are based on uh, what have been running in Monash uh, University in, in Australia, uh, where we implement uh, hybrid learning, uh, facilitator drive, uh, driven learning culture, and also uh, we implement uh, a academic culture where the students are learning from best practices and experts in public health. Uh, but of course, there are 
some adaptation uh, need to, needed to be done because, as you know, like Indonesia is a big country. Uh, we do have uh, nearly 280 uh, uh, million uh, people uh, with very diverse, um, you know, socioeconomic status, demographic, and so on. So, um, taking that into consideration, we, uh, in the first two years of our programs, we, we try to do some uh, adaptation in our uh, program. So today, I think I just wanted to talk about these uh, three uh, aspects of our teaching. First one is that the fact that we have a diverse teaching staff and we invited um, uh, guest lecturers uh, with lived experience. And also touching on uh, how we use, you know, real world public and global health issues or case studies that are relevant to Indonesia for both teaching materials and also for uh, our assessment. So I just wanted to also introduce you to the uh, five teaching staff that we have now in uh, Master of Public Health program in Indonesia. As you see here, um, generally, it's a, uh, I'm, I'm the only male, that's of course. Um, uh, we are uh, very uh, diverse in terms of um, academic backgrounds and also in terms of uh, uh, culture. Even though you can see there are three Indonesian uh, uh, staff there, we are not actually coming from similar cultural background. Um, like for myself and Grace, we are more uh, coming from eastern part of Indonesia and then we have Athena who are coming from Java, uh, the biggest uh, island and the most populated island in, uh, in Indonesia. So three of us itself uh, reflecting uh, a very diverse, uh, you know, uh, academic background and also cultural background. And we do have two uh, uh, international academics from, uh, maybe some of you uh, seen Claudia yesterday, uh, she, she is Canadian. Um, and also we have uh, Gabriela Fernando, uh, she is from uh, Australia. So uh, five of, uh, uh, all of us actually uh, graduated from very different, uh, you know, settings like I myself and Claudia from, from the UK and then we have Gabriela who, who had been exposed to uh, academic culture in, in Australia and Athena in, in, in Taiwan and Grace in uh, um, the Netherlands and the US. So uh, we come together uh, bringing different uh, you know, experience and different uh, academic culture, uh, both international and also local uh, uh, culture. Um, in addition to, do, to having a diverse um, you know, uh, teaching staff, we also uh, invited some uh, guest lecturers with lived experience expertise, especially when we want to discuss something that really culturally sensitive, for example, like, like in Indonesia, you, uh, you know that uh, things like um, uh, sexual health, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, and also uh, HIV and other sexual transmitted diseases are sensitive um, public health topics to be, you know, to be discussed in, in, in public. So when it comes to that matter, uh, we think that bringing, uh, you know, doing it by bringing uh, experts with lived experience uh, is one way to, you know, to, uh, to increase the awareness uh, for the student and also for, for the public because sometimes we, we have the guest lecture uh, open for public as well. So here, for example, we have a, in one of our um, unit uh, promotion, uh, health promotion and, and, and public health policy, we invited, um, I th uh, yeah, we consented this, uh, this photograph, uh, don't worry. So we, <laughs> we invited Allegra, uh, who has been a tireless advocate for sexual and reproductive health rights. And so um, she, she is uh, one of the first, I think, Indonesia's uh, transgender doctor um, who, uh, who share many challenging topics on the future of health promotion, equity and human rights with the next generation of public leaders and policymakers in Indonesia. And the session uh, has been really uh, engaging because, you know, we, we directly learn from, um, um, from the uh, expert and one, uh, of the surprise that I got from the second cohort is that I didn't realize that uh, we grow so fast. And then uh, there's kind of a uh, cultural shift uh, in our, 
youth, uh, young, younger generation, because when, when we had our, our first gathering with the new student and, and informally, and we, we, we share, uh, you know, we, we tell our, who we are, uh, our background, and, and then suddenly one of our students uh, willingly, openly said that I joined the public health because I have HIV. <laughs> something that's really uh, not Indonesian, you know what I mean? So that's also something uh, surprising uh, uh, for me. So I think there are a lot of things that needs to be um, rethink about the way uh, now the younger generation think about you know public health, about sensitive topics, and so on. Um, other things uh, that we've done as well, uh, uh, we also um, you know invited um, some uh, pra uh, public health practitioner in in this. Left side, for example, so we invited the Secretary General Director of the Health of uh, Ministry of Health of Indonesia, where he um, shared to our student about how the government is doing the healthcare transformation and how they actually uh, try to uh, capture the phenomena in the grassroots. So by empowering community and so on. So uh, doing that also. Uh, we, we believe can also improve the awareness of uh, our student uh, related to what actually happened at the national level and what actually needed in, 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 you know, in the sub-national level. Um, other other, other uh, guest lecture that we invited also, like uh, a very senior Indonesian science journalist who, who has been focusing her work on uh, health and also uh, climate. So uh, she also um, shared uh, her expert expertise on, you know, how how she actually work uh, on science communication, how the culture in our uh, Indonesian academic uh, nowadays, you know, how hard it is for the scientists to, to you know, to approach the sci uh, scientists, to communicate the science to, uh, to public and so on. Um, uh, the next thing is, um, really about using uh, another adaptation that we do is really about using the you know global health issues relevant to Indonesia so for that matters in our teaching uh, when for example uh, in one of my units uh, in introductory epidemiology when we talk about study design you know cross-sectional cohort and also uh, case control we try to bring uh, an example of the study that we actually as academics have done uh, that can illustrate both, uh, you know, the methodological aspect of the uh, of the study that we want to, the student to understand, but also at the same time um, can increase the awareness of the uh, students uh, about the socio-cultural context of, you know, public and population health uh, in Indonesia. For example, here um, during the pandemic, we know that the health inequity uh, play important roles in affecting the health outcomes in Indonesia. So not only in, at the individual level uh, uh, inequity, but also at community level and also uh, at healthcare facility. So the use of this uh, kind of, um, you know, real world examples of our uh, public health and global health research uh, in, in our daily teaching is really uh, helpful. Uh, at least for us in Indonesia, uh, you are freely to you know to share uh, your other experience in other countries. Um, also, uh, that uh, the use of case studies, local case studies, has been really useful for our program because we found that our students are really uh, engaged, uh, especially when they do the assessment. Uh, for example, here one of the uh, a student's assessment uh, on doing policy analysis of uh, for mon mental health um, has has won uh, uh, an award uh, from the Herfit Center in uh, uh, in, in Monash uh, in Indonesia. So here uh, the student um, you know initiatively uh, brings uh, the issue of mental health uh, policy, especially about uh, what we call as uh, pasung. Uh, which is, I think, cycling in 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 English. In English. Um, the very common practice uh, of people of local community when they do have family members or relatives that have a uh, mental health uh, issues, and you will be surprised by the, sorry, by by the the fact that um, I think uh, up to the latest data that I can find um, in the second. Uh, 
uh, second uh, quartiles of 2023, there are still around uh, 4,300 uh, cases of cycling. So where they do have uh, family members or relatives, uh, and then they just do this, you know, instead of bringing them to the, the, the healthcare facility. So this is also one of, uh, I think, um, cultural uh, context and cultural problems that has been brought up by the student itself, you know. Um, I think last thing that I want to share is also related to uh, this. Uh, again, uh, using the, the examples from uh, the study that has been done in Indonesia that um, bring the you know sociocultural aspect of uh, social determinants of health. Um, for example, in here, in, in one of the uh, unit assessment, we uh, we gave our students uh, these three. Uh, you know these three papers uh, for them to choose and then to you know to do some critical appraisal and then to summarize, summarize it in in one short video in two minutes video and I was also surprised because they the students are very creative <laughs> in a way and uh, I can show you one of the uh, example of the student uh, video of course with uh, several limitation but I think it's a really inter interesting video let me try to play it. Thank you. Oh, there is no sound. <laughs> Sorry. How do we do that? Oh, no. Sorry. It's okay. okay. HIV infections. In the Asia-Pacific region, HIV concentrated among key population of MSM, female sex workers, people who inject drugs, and transgender women. Shockingly, less than 50% aware of their HIV status, and only a third are referred for treatment. What about Indonesia? Januraga et al. conducted a study in cities with high HIV prevalence among key population. Out of 831 HIV-positive patients, 85% were linked to HIV care and 73% started HIV treatment or antiretroviral therapy. Remember, treatment doesn't cure HIV, but it keeps the virus in check. That's why continuous treatment is crucial. Viral load testing measured the effectiveness of HIV treatment by tracking virus level. We aim to see a decrease with HIV treatment. In the study, only 55% attended follow-up visits and only 39% took well load tests. However, just 35% reached their treatment goal. To wrap up, Indonesia HIV treatment retention and targeted viral suppression rate need improvement. Let's work together to ensure better detection and support for HIV patients to reach their treatment goals. With proper care, people with HIV can lead fulfilling lives. What can we do? First, get yourself tested to know your status. And second, spread the word to be more rich in literacy. Remember, small steps lead to big changes. Stay informed and stay healthy. Bye! Thank you. I think, I, uh, yeah, I, I end my uh, talk uh, with that video, so, and welcome uh, uh, questions later. How do I stop this? Thank you very much. Thank you, Henry. Fantastic, and I think it was an, a nice integration of um, what um, Ali's talked about um, and Claire with authentic assessment and um, translating it into practice. So our final speaker um, is um, someone I like to call our educational innovator, Professor Basha Dewey, who will uh, talk about um, various examples, I, I guess, of um, the three um, um, talks that we've um, seen in practice. Basha, over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for having me today. Um, many thanks to Dragon for organising this session and to my colleagues that spoke earlier today. Um, as Dragon mentioned, I'm from the School of Public Health and I have a wonderful job. I'm the head of undergraduate courses uh, and I happen to really love my job. So here I'm going to talk to you a little bit about workforce development and planning the future. But I'm going to do this by actually thinking about all the things my colleagues said today and really just give you some four key examples. Um, so before I start off, I would like to also acknowledge, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we are on um, and pay my respects to elders past, present and future. 
Now, yesterday, I'm sure you heard a lot about planning for the future, but you heard about where we live today. And where we live today is in a world full of uncertainty and full of change. We're highly connected, full of mobility, where we need to adapt and really requires us to adapt quickly. We're in a world that require, that where we have a lot of access to easy, accessible information and misinformation, and you'll have a session on that tomorrow as well. And that's the land that we find ourselves um, that where our graduates are. That is what we have to prepare our public health graduates for, a really busy, hectic, uh, interconnected world. So I want to show you what our commitment is at the School of Public Health and how we've been doing this, how we've been accepting the challenge of our faculty and our, uh, our peers and our, our but also listening to our partners uh, through both local and international to make sure that we make public health ready graduates. This is just some of the examples. I'm really going for a quick snapshot in time. And if you're interested in any of these, I'm very happy to talk to you about them more. Um, and I'm lucky, I work in a great team of educators and innovators. So the, none of these things happen uh, without collaboration. Let me show you one of, a, one of the newest examples. So adapting to change misinformation in the workforce, Mythbusters. This assessment has actually been around for a while. It was originally authentic assessment. And as Ali said earlier today, ChatGPT came around at the end of 2022 with much uproar um, in, our, in, in our space of education. How is it going to be used by educators? How are students going to use it? Well, this is how we used it at the School of Public Health. First year Bachelor of Health Science and Bachelor of Public Health students were already learning how to critically think, how could you search the literature in a unit called research and evidence? And the idea here was, let's pivot this assessment, this already authentic experience that we need in our workforce, and how can we compare what the generative AI chat GPT is doing by asking them some really simple questions. And what you can see here is some output. Do you support or refute this health advice is just one of the interesting questions that I think over the years will change. And chat GDP was like, as a language model, I don't have any personal opinions or beliefs. So I think what you'll find is that chat GPT, we didn't know it was going to answer, and the students were really surprised what this uh, new technology could actually do. But the focus here, the focus of the learning here was, yes, it's already an authentic assessment, but what we wanted to do is explore new technologies and areas of uncertainty and give our students the skills they need in the workforce to deal with something that's changing um, and something that they can use and build into their education at a very basic level by, while still teaching those critical thinking skills. They're still learning those standard methods of using Ovid Medline, of using Embay. They're still learning how to use the literature, uh, search literature in the ways that we want and still being those deep critical thinkers that we need in public health. Um, our medical degree at Monash. Our medical degree at Monash is a five-year degree. Actually, we have two entries. Undergraduate is five-year um, and postgraduate is four-year. We have, I've, I've labelled at the top, we have a theme to population health. We have a vertically integrated population health stream in all of our years of the medical degree. That's how much we value population and public health. We think it's that important that our students learn it throughout their whole medical degree. So when we were transitioning from an MBBS um, and upskilling our future medical workforce from a Bachelor of Medicine, um, Bachelor of Surgery to an MD, so a doctoral level, we needed to think about that Australian qualification framework and where what we had to do was actually increase the research methods. We looked to theme two to increase our commitment to making sure that our medical students are getting that uh, research method thinking, that, uh, that critical thinking, learning more bias statistics in an authentic way. In addition to that, we also had, uh, we also in added a preventive medicine summit, exposure to experts bringing in this live experience. We can't simulate, sadly, a World Health Summit for our students as much as we'd like to, but we do try to simulate experiences where they can connect with the leading experts, both locally and globally, that are our partners and that work with us. Um, and with the research methods, then we thought in fifth year, why don't we give them a scholarly intensive placement and bring them into the work that we're doing at the School of Public Health in a six-week um, a six week intensive full-time research placement, hands-on, getting involved with everything from, you know, you've heard from Alec, um, the Australian Living Guidelines. They, I heard students presenting about that just week, last week. That all started in 2018. We graduated our first MD students in 2020. Uh, another example, an alliance actually that was, uh, between, that was led by Dragon and the Monash Warwick Alliance. This is about our Master of Public Health. So the, the grant that we got here was Pathways to the Public Workforce, where we're partnering with our Warwick colleagues uh, in the Master of Public Health to create a global practicum. 
But this idea was proposed in 2018, well before um, we even thought that COVID was even a possibility, with the aim to share wellbeing, knowledge and skills between the community and the classroom. The focus here is more than, more than just the international experience. It's about ac access, it's about equity, and it's about virtual mobility. How can we give all our students, even those that cannot travel overseas, that ability to explore and connect with our partners who are not, uh, who are not local to them and local to us? How can we extend and make that internet connected world even closer to our graduates? So this is about developing communication skills, professionalism, intercultural competency skills, making sure that we have that shared language across that space uh, in an authentic setting and providing that international network. And last but not least, we couldn't, couldn't finish without an innovation. So how is our innovation shaping the workforce? Well, we developed an app called the Global Classroom. Developing an app is really hard, is something that I've learnt. Um, you, you think it's, it's easy and a little icon, it's really not. Another Monitor Warwick Alliance supported grant, uh, where what we wanted to do was bring together our students from Malaysia, Warwick, so a Monash Malaysia campus, Monash Australia campus, both rural and uh, metropolitan, and our Warwick colleagues. Um, and we wanted to bring them together to simulate a case-based learning classroom where they get a patient and they're on this app and they can work over two weeks in their own time to help this patient over time. And you can see some great screenshots of just what the students see on the left. Um, and then on the, on the other side, you can see the conversation they had about um, cultural considerations as they were prompted with various things saying, have you thought about this? Um, that was already pre-generated into the app. Now, the goal behind this global classroom and the goal that it's still going is to simulate an international network um, that collaborates, but also having students collaborate and cooperate really over uh, developing a global fluency because we're after global citizens in public health. We want to cu cultivate cultural competence through these kinds of shared safe spaces um, and we want to really give them that international mobility experience without going anywhere. So learning and building your networks, learning professionalism, communication skills, but also just working together as a team um, across the globe. So these are some of the things that we started in 2019 and we've piloted this one twice now. The skills of our graduates and what we're looking to develop at the School of Public Health and in all our public health courses or programs that teach into other degrees um, include cultural, intercultural competence. We want to have graduates that are resilient to change. I think the 2020 word of the year was pivot, but that's where our head's at. How can we make sure that they can take, uh, take an idea and how they can innovate an enterprise? We're all about developing students who have our core values and our commitment to them. Uh, and that includes good professionalism skills and excellent communication skills. Fundamentally, the public health students, we want them to have excellent research literacy skills and health literacy skills and an understanding of both the social and the commercial determinants of health, which you've no doubt heard about this week. And this is the commitment from our School of Public Health and our, us as educators to our students. We want to extend the partnerships that, um, and our strategic partnerships um, with a focus on developed capabilities in the areas of need in public health. We want to provide authentic learning experiences that build skills that understand our current landscape, which is changing. And we want to continue to drive enterprising innovation in, that, that meets the need of our public health workforce. I'd like to thank all the educators and collaborators that make our public um, health work, uh, our public health degrees so excellent. Um, and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Basha. So um, what I'd like to do is invite our panelists, our speakers up uh, to the stage. Um, and I think we're gonna have some uh, uh, time and an opportunity for a discussion, so I think we've got some microphones roaming around, so uh, feel free, um, if you need a coffee, uh, to get some courage, grab your coffee. Um, we've got our panel for the next uh, little bit to, to ask some questions, so um, feel free to, to do so. Um, whilst you're gathering your thoughts, um, don't have anyone as yet, I might ask um, the, the first uh, question, and, and um, maybe to, to Claire, if I can ask it, uh, to you, if that's okay. Um, so, yes, you are slightly turning me. I'm, 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 a, I'm a big fan of uh, authentic assessment and programmatic assessment. Um, having said that, um, a lot of our students um, have been sort of uh, coming through through the system uh, under well at a secondary school level and an undergraduate level of you know very much a focus on, on on my grades. I need to get a certain grade and whatnot. 
how, do, how, well, how have the students reacted to, to the big changes of um, going to a, a competency-based assessment, uh, a programmatic assessment, and uh, assessment not so much focused on uh, the decimal points, but whether or not you're, you're, you're at a particular standard? Yeah, great. Um, so I'll make two comments there. One is that our med degree has changed from a past grade only for years one, two and five and the response has been extraordinary. Um, the students focus much more on uh, working together um, and not so much on that com competition to be the best. Um, and so we've got some work to do across the faculties for others to think about that way. Um, there's uh, also really clear literature that shows that it does foster collaboration and teamwork and arguably probably a really important skill that we want to be nurturing in our graduates um, and, you know, reduces stress and anxiety when we get rid of grades, so we need to really think about that. Um, in terms of how we bring um, uh, or change a culture around assessment, you're right, we have Year 12 um, school leavers that have come through a system that's very much focused on exams and, and grades and getting a mark to actually get into the university. I think it's about setting expectations really clearly and showing them the journey. So, um, with, that, with the risk of over, overwhelming them, I think showing them you know, what their journey of assessment and how we're going to show them that they've achieved the outcomes um, that are guaranteeing that they're the ones, not a robot that's completed the degree and how we're going to assess them along the way, their role in that and being really explicit about that whole piece of work. Um, we, you know, it's hard, I think, to think about how we have a grade sitting underneath, but there's the thing, you know, they're pragmatic, practical things that I think we can work towards, but it's about having conversations around assessment and rather it being you know, something that we do to students, it's, uh, it's got to be much more equal. I hope I answered that, Dragon. Fantastic. Thanks, Claire. Um, I'll open up. Uh, so we've got two questions. So Jonathan and then uh, Adiba down the bottom. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan Patz, University of Wisconsin, and on sabbatical here at Monash. Um, uh, Basia, your last uh, slide, I noticed that you talked about social and commercial determinants. Um, in the United States recently, for the Masters of Public Health program, they took out environmental health that used to be in a required course as a core area. And of course, in our interconnected world, when we're recognizing the importance of uh, environmental conditions, and of course, yesterday was Earth Day, um, and with the growing movement of planetary health as a real focus, a framework, um, is there uh, expansion of, of the De definition of prepping health students to uh, embrace these other uh, interdependent determinants of health, especially around planetary health. Um, thanks, Jonathan, for that question. I look at a course map for a um, few degrees quite often. I think public health is one of the hardest areas because we have so many different topics. So one thing that I think is important for any public health graduate is to have the research skills and then we can inter vertically integrate topics throughout. That being said, planetary health is something we do have in our undergraduate courses and we do have it in our postgraduate courses. Um, we have a very strong uh, research group um, at the School of Public Health that is in that space, well, many researchers in that space, and that's something that we think is very important for our graduates to understand because it is just part of the social determinants. But it needs to be more than it standalone unit. It needs to be part of, you're doing, re, you know, you're doing that research evidence in medicine unit that I showed you. There should be examples of that, um, that students can pick if that's the assessment that they want to do and that's their area of interest. We can thread really important topics to fit the needs of our students and their passions as well. And then they can explore that um, through other different ways while developing the core skills that we want them to have. Just to add to that, we, um, we have a faculty fellowship that's working on uh, co-designing planetary health curriculum. So um, in the next few months, we'll have a resource available that's been co-designed between academics and students around what they'd like to learn around planetary health. So a bunch of different lessons that'll be out there for the world. And we, we just, you know, while the principles around global and planetary health have been articulated as to what our graduates know, there's not a lot of examples of really high quality curricula that's been published and accessible to the world. So hopefully that'll be available soon. Brilliant. And Jonathan, Thank there's you. a great session this evening that Karen Lee is running. So, you know, just a plug. That's, that's great. Thanks, Pasha. Uh, we've got a question down here, Diva. 
Yeah, thanks. Great session. I, I have two questions, actually. One is in relation to um, the syllabus. Just like in undergraduate medicine, how do you pack everything in um, and, and, and bring in other disciplines, um, design, you know, systems thinking, engineers, social scientists, behavioral science in an already packed um, curriculum that requires, you know, the core epi, biostats, etc. And a second um, related question is around many people who want to do public health and not just traditional doctors, um, et cetera, but also from other disciplines and often are already working. So particularly to Ellie, how, how do we make the course more flexible um, and allow people to kind of go through this journey um, without the usual kind of academic requirements that make it so rigid and, and put a lot of people off. So in regards to interdisciplinary learning, it's one of the biggest challenges, I think, I mean, Claire might even add to it, that, that we have at, at, just from a space perspective, how to get the students timetabled and working together and how to build units that require that. Um, the global classroom's next step is to be interdisciplinary. The first, we tried international, but why not be international and interdisciplinary and build cases where we need all those different aspects? So it is definitely something we're thinking on and it's something that's the next step. Um, I know that there are groups like COIL within the, um, within the university that are doing that collaborative interdisciplinary learning, um, probably a bit better than I, well, that we are, so we're just learning our way to, to get there. Claire? Yeah, and just to comment on the overcrowded curriculum, I think it's a massive issue. Um, and I think we need to, and Basia sort of touched on it with that um, previous comment around we need to focus much more on concepts rather than content. And so if we teach, you know, evidence-based practice as a concept and we need to use and change the exemplars to be about relevant issues and we need to, we need to let people let go of stuff that may not be as relevant now as it was 10 years ago so that we can evolve our examples around prevalent and important issues that are there. So coming back to, okay, what are the core concepts we need? And these have been articulated in, in nursing and a couple of other professions, but it's not the way we tend to do curricula and I really think we need to think about how we're going forward with that. Thank you for the question. Um, the answer should be that it's very easy to do that. And I think in institutions that are more attuned to postgraduate online learners, you and some, I can see some nodding heads, they'd be thinking it's very easy. Why is this even a question? But it is a question. In some, in, a, a good question for some institutions. And yes, I think, for example, Monash University is one that has the ethos of an undergraduate on-campus learner. Um, and really the response to your question about flexibility is it's a flexibility that's required in terms of the way that we deliver. So either hybrid learning or online and face-to-face -face learning, not, you know, or, or hybrid, you know, or all permutations. So it's about how we deliver, but it's also the mindsets by those who deliver. It's about an acknowledgement that professionals now are young and old, that they bring a, whole, a wealth of experience. It talks to some of the points that Claire made about how we construct assessments that engage and provide those professionals who are shifting careers or bringing different disciplinary backgrounds or professional experiences to an assessment piece such that they can find themselves in the piece and they can use that piece to take them where they want to go. It involves educators um, who understand education in that way that are, op that are able to open up and, and, and Henry used the word facilitate. Facilitate the learning of diverse peoples, yeah, and professionals who have particular interests. There are core skills, but there's ways of meeting their interests and their aspirations. So the answer is it should be very easy. Um, but the reality is, is it's back to the journey that we need to take our community on to open up, to see a connection between the outside and the inside, and to understand that we need to bridge that. And that's the power of the flexibility that we need. And I hope we can go on that journey. Fantastic. Um, I think maybe we've got time for a really quick question because I can hear the bell going and I'm getting flashbacks to my primary school Thanks, Ragan. Ben Kenny, University of Adelaide, thanks so much for the session and really enjoyed the discussion about AI and the like. The question's about the hidden curriculum in health professions education. Students, in my experience, 
uh, their big driver is I want to look like you and you is often not the academic, you is often the, the practising professional who are embracing but somewhat slowly the concepts you're talking about which I really adhere to and, and applaud. What, what tactics are you using to try and overcome that hidden curriculum element? You mean in terms of AI, Ben? Well, AI and general behaviours, yes. Um, I think it's becoming less hidden. I think it's about being making it much more explicit that actually we can define what professionalism is, for example. It's one of the things that I, I think is coined one of the most hidden of all curricula. And I think at Monash, certainly, we've made that very explicit. We have a ready reckoner that describes every type of professional attribute you could possibly ever imagine, thanks to Lynn Clarahan and her work, um, and actually articulating our expectations. Um, and then we have, uh, you know, an, a an assessment regime that sort of sits behind that, so actually making it very clear what our standards are around that. So I think it's it's getting rid of what's hidden and actually, you know, unhiding it and teaching it to what it needs to be. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Claire, and thanks, Ben, for that question. Um, I see we've got about five minutes before we have to rush off to a plenary. I had a whole host of questions that I was going to ask our panel, but um, unfortunately, as I say, um, when you're having fun, um, time's short. So um, please thank me, uh, join me even, in thanking our panel. Um, and thank you to all of you for coming out so early uh, in the day and, and making this session a, a great success. Uh, please stick around. Um, we're happy to um, chat um, after this session and, and continue the conversation moving forward. Thanks, Brian. Cheers. Thanks, guys.